Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm David Feldman, and this is the mop up for April 14th, 2023. The FBI arrested a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard yesterday, charging him with leaking hundreds of government documents on social media. The FBI says the man was taken into custody as part of an undercover operation called Arrest Somebody, Anybody. The Department of Justice wants to know how a trove of highly classified Pentagon secrets got leaked on social media And more importantly, why it only got 50 likes. The material that was leaked revealed weaknesses in Ukraine's air defenses and revealed that Ukraine is quickly running out of ammunition. This is top secret information only known by our intelligence agencies or anyone who ever listened to one of Joe Biden's 5,000 speeches begging Congress to spend more on Ukraine. Some of the secrets revealed are that our military spies on our allies, allies like South Korea, Israel, and of course, America's closest ally, the United States taxpayer. Meanwhile, Senator Dick Durbin, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, said he will launch an investigation into Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's millions of dollars worth of vacations paid for by conservative billionaire and activist Harlan Crow, who it turns out today purchased Thomas's childhood home and plans to turn it into a museum, the Clarence Thomas Museum, where every wing is a nut. Thomas insists he only took the gifts because Harlan Crow has no business before the court. And Harlan Crow has no business before the court only because of all the gifts Clarence Thomas took from him. The Democrats will hold their 2024 national convention in Chicago because we all know how well that went the last time back in 1968. The president wanted Chicago because that way the mayor could introduce him and Biden would finally get to lead a chant of let's go, Brandon. See, the mayor of Chicago is named Brandon Johnson. So after he introduces Joe Biden, Biden could lead a chant of let's go, Brandon. Donald Trump has filed a five hundred million dollar lawsuit against his former attorney, Michael Cohen, claiming Cohen lied about him. $500 million is an interesting figure when you consider that if Trump had a penny for every lie Trump ever told, he'd have exactly that amount, $500 million. Trump is in trouble with the Federal Election Commission. After he missed the deadline, all candidates must meet to file their personal financial disclosures. The FEC takes personal financial disclosures very seriously and is expected to level a wallet crushing fine of two hundred dollars. That is the truth. Two hundred dollar fine. Two hundred dollars. This country's campaign finance laws have fewer teeth than the front row at a Trump rally. Because here in America, we take campaign finance laws about as seriously as we take our laws banning union busting. I think $200 is also what Starbucks got fined by the NLRB for firing all those union organizers. Meanwhile, a representative for the ex-president is asking the FEC for a series of extensions, but only for Trump's hair. The financial disclosures would offer up the first glimpse into Trump's post-presidency business dealings, according to experts. But really, do we need to see Trump's books? We already know the drill. Get indicted. Ask people with a third grade education to donate their welfare checks for your legal fees. Use that money to pay off the Russian mobsters who want their vig. Don't use it to pay your lawyers rinse and repeat. Melania, Trump's latest concubine, has been noticeably absent lately. 
Mar-a-Lago insiders say she's come down with a slight case of self-respect. Melania didn't accompany Trump to New York for last week's arrest. She didn't accompany him to New York for this week's deposition before the New York State Attorney General, Letitia James. But in all fairness, Trump didn't want Melania with him, with Letitia James breathing down his back. The guy can only handle one woman at a time trying to take all his money. Letitia James' civil trial against Trump is scheduled for October of this year. She's charging Trump and his three children of fraud on what she calls a level that is simply staggering. In her civil suit, James is demanding $250 million, which might explain why during Thursday's deposition, Trump accidentally referred to her as Vladimir Putin. In this trial, Trump is accused of inflating his assets when he needs collateral for a loan and deflating his assets when the government wants his money, like, you know, after he loses this case. Can you say bankruptcy number seven? This is now what is called the discovery phase of the trial. Trump was deposed last year and took the fifth. Literally, he stole the Fifth Amendment and kept it along with several moderately priced fountain pens from Staples. During last year's deposition, Trump told Letitia James that only a complete idiot wouldn't plead the Fifth. And yet he pled the Fifth. Trump accused the state attorney general of conducting a witch hunt. The problem with calling this a witch hunt, of course, is that nobody's accusing Trump of being a witch because his pointy hats are white, not black, and they're actually more of a hood than a hat. In filing the lawsuit, Letitia James said she wants to forbid Donald and his three swinishly feeble-minded children from ever running a business in New York State ever again. Wow, that would be a real hit to our economy. Tens of thousands of jobs lost in the bill collecting sector. Forbidding the Trump children from running a business. Is money laundering a business? I guess it is. Trump has repeatedly accused State Attorney General Letitia James, who is African-American, of being racist. And I must admit, when it comes to judging racists, Donald Trump is an expert witness. Trump insists there would be no trial if he were black. Of course not. New York police would have shot him in the back decades ago. Trump's motorcade arrived at the attorney general's office at 10 a.m. on Thursday. As he approached the underground garage, Trump was inundated by chants of we hate you. And that was just his Secret Service team from inside the limousine. You see, Trump is all alone. Melania did, however, appear with him publicly for an Easter Sunday brunch in Mar-a-Lago. In other words, his check cleared. The waiter came over and asked if he could get her anything, and Melania said yes, the number for Melinda Gates' divorce attorney. When the couple dines at Mar-a-Lago, Melania instructs the waitstaff to put out two velvet ropes, one around the couple's table, the other around her vagina. Insiders tell the New York Post that Trump told Melania he really, really needs her out there with him on the campaign trail, smiling and holding his hand. Melania explained, I'm a model, not an actress. But Melania is encouraging Donald to run for the same exact reason she encourages him to have sex with as many porn stars as possible because he's 76 and she hopes it will kill him. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, along with the heads of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, complained today that China is lending money to poor countries and then waiting until they can't pay the money back in order to quietly take over the inner workings of their financial institutions. Gee, I I wonder where China learned how to do something like that. You know, behave like a loan shark and perform a bust out on any poor country that can't pay them back. That's pretty nasty stuff. You know, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and of course, the United States should get to the bottom of this and launch a full scale investigation into who taught China that when you lend money to poor countries that can't pay you back, you can end up owning them. We should find out it would be very valuable 
to to discover who the people are who taught China this. The the IMF, the World Bank of the United States should get should get right on this and find out who taught China how to do this. Very upsetting. Jury selection began today in Dominion Voting Machine's one point six billion dollar defamation suit against Fox News. Dominion accuses Fox of maliciously misleading viewers into believing that Dominion Voting Machines was part of a vast conspiracy to steal the 2020 election for Joe Biden. Lawyers for Fox say this case is about more than just Fox News. It's about protecting Fox News's constitutional right to destroy our Constitution. Dominion, as I just said, is asking for one point six billion dollars in damages, which seems like a lot until you consider that was what Roger Ailes budgeted each year for raping his female employees. Roger Ailes had a one point six billion dollar a year rape budget. Roger Ailes, founder of Fox News. Dominion is also suing my pillow CEO Mike Lindell and Rudy Giuliani for considerably less than one point six billion dollars. Since between the two of them, there's maybe a hot plate and a five dollar gift certificate to win Dixie. Jury selection began today with 300 potential jurors summoned to a Delaware courtroom begging the question. Delaware actually has 300 people. Delaware? Delaware is just an offshore money laundering operation. I'm being serious. Its official nickname is the Suspicious Financial Activity State. On Wednesday, the judge in the case reprimanded Fox News for withholding key documents and said, moving forward, the company now has, quote, a credibility problem. Credibility problem, by the way, was the original name for the five Lawyers for Dominion say they are missing key documents belonging to Fox News chief Rupert Murdoch. Murdoch's lawyer said Murdoch's or anybody's emails are inadmissible because they're private and only belong on the front page of the news of the world after someone's phone has been hacked. Meanwhile, audio tapes were played in court on Wednesday of Fox News anchor Maria Bartiroma asking Trump's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, if he had any hard evidence of voter fraud. Rudy is heard on tape saying, quote, that's a little bit harder. Giuliani insists that's a little bit harder wasn't referring to evidence, but instead the Fox News green room's selection of whiskey. Ah, that's a little bit harder. Rudy is an alcoholic. I I read more books about the Trump administration than anyone should. And every book brings up his alcoholism. Rudy was ripped election night and nobody can recall a day he didn't reek of liver disease. Forget counting the vote. I want to see Rudy count backwards from 10. Here's the important thing to remember. Rudy was Trump's attorney because... Not in spite of, but because of his drinking problem. Trump finds liquor on someone's breath very comforting because it's the only thing he ever smelled when his mother or any woman told him they loved him. Do you realize how different the past eight years would be if Donald heard the words, I love you, from one woman not reeking of three-day-old scotch, cigarettes, bulimia vomit, and Percodan. Just one woman saying, I love you, not reeking of three-day-old scotch, cigarettes, bulimia vomit, and Percodan. Yeah, Rudy Giuliani is a drunk. In 20 years, he's gone from 9-11 to 7-7, and from comb-over to hungover. And that's why Trump keeps using him Because Rudy's a drunk. The key to success in Washington or corporate America is being compromised. And Rudy is compromised. He's a drunk. You're less of a threat and easier to control. The people in charge don't want an independent thinker who can't be contained. You want to move up in Hollywood, Washington, academia, any place where it's about power and control, Pretend you're a drunk. Pretend you have a secret sex life. Make them believe there's dirt on you. 
You can run the world if the people who really run it think they can put a manila envelope in front of you with some compromising photographs and you'll do what you're told. That's my advice to young kids starting out. Forget the MBA, forget law school, go to work and pretend you're a filthy, disgusting person. Your boss will ask you to marry his daughter. That's how Rupert Murdoch operates. He hires broken down people. Nobody would ever hire Sean Hannity. Maria Bartiromo was through. She came to Fox News after CNBC because she was out of options. That's how you control costs. Only hire desperate people. It's how you keep them working for you on the cheap. All of Rupert Murdoch's employees at Fox News are automatically tainted the second they walk through those doors. Where else are they going to go? I don't care how much Greg Gutfeld makes for Fox. Where is he going to go? Who would hire Greg Gutfeld other than Fox News? He's permanently stained. He can't negotiate a contract. Megyn Kelly tried. She left. She left Fox News for NBC. Within five seconds, she was fired for saying something about blackface. Nobody is ever going to hire anybody if they work for Fox News. That's how Rupert keeps his costs down. His staff knows they're tainted. They're not going to ask for, ri- for, for uh, raises. Now, I don't know how this Dominion case plays out. A lot of legal experts say Fox News is on shaky legal ground. Defamation is hard to prove in America, but willful negligence is not protected by our First Amendment. So if you broadcast news that you know is wrong, but you go ahead and broadcast it anyway, that's willful negligence. That's defamation. They may lose. This is an important case because Fox News is and it remains the number one source of news on cable television. In other words, it's for old people who can't cut the cord because the people running the assisted living facility won't trust them with a pair of scissors. Fox News is for people who are too stupid to realize cable television is a complete ripoff. Right? It's a ripoff. We all know that. And if you're too stupid to figure that one out, then you're an easy mark for being sold reverse mortgages, gold for your IRA or ideas like tax cuts for the rich will balance the federal budget. It's the perfect audience. People who still have cable. It's perfect, perfect audience for people who want to sell things that are fraudulent Its entire audience, Fox News' entire audience is over the age of 65, and Fox News is designed to accelerate the speed at which an already diminishing mind deteriorates. Fox News speeds up the aging process. What I'm saying is check your grandfather's cable package. It may not be Alzheimer's. It just might be Fox News. If you or someone you know is a senior with cable, you run the risk of early onset of dementia. Warning signs include Brett Baer, Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity. So why is Fox News popular among people with one and a half feet in the grave? It is old people. Why? Well, first off, it's important to remind everyone that not all senior citizens are completely cut off from their loved ones, which is why most senior citizens don't watch Fox News. Most senior citizens don't watch Fox News because they live productive lives, enjoying their friends. And if they're lucky, their grandchildren, they've accrued enough life experience to know they're borrowing the planet And the only way to find peace with the human condition is to dedicate all your free time to leaving this place better than when we found it. Most senior citizens know that, which is why most senior citizens don't watch Fox News. But there are the few million who do watch Fox News because they hate their grandchildren. They hate their wives, their neighbors. They hate everyone. And it's everyone else's fault 
not theirs. That's why they watch Fox News. Nobody invites them anywhere because they're insufferable pricks. Their phone never rings. Their phone never rings. And, and Fox News is the only company they have. It's on 24 hours a day, teaching them, reminding them to blame everyone else for their miserable, loveless existence. Senior citizens who watch Fox News are incapable of affection. That's why they love the flag and our military, because our flag and our military never told them they were a lousy lay. Nobody is effing these senior citizens because they're lousy lays. So the only thing they can love is the flag or our military. This is the channel for men and women who pretend at humanity. They'd rather cry at the national anthem than from their grandkids. Because grandkids always ask, why does Pop Pop smell like a fart that died from cabbage poisoning? The people who watch Fox News smell like a fart that died from cabbage poisoning. I've been to Fox News. I've walked around their headquarters. It smells like a fart that died from cabbage poisoning. People who watch Fox News smell the people on Fox News all smell the men, the women, all their orifices are sugary mixtures of yeast, decay and fly larvae. Fox News is for people who are unhealthy or want to be unhealthy. You watch Fox News because you're going to die and you don't want to die alone. You want everyone to die with you. So no Medicare for all. Climate change. It's not real. More guns, more guns, more war, more cops shooting people in the back because let's all die together. I, I don't want to be alone, which is why there is no Fox News in Canada or Great Britain. Nobody watches it in Canada or Great Britain. They tried. People think it, that it's banned in Canada. It's not. They try to put Fox News on in Canada and in Great Britain. Nobody Watches it. Canadians, the Brits, Canadians and Brits, they don't want any part of Fox News because those countries have something resembling universal health care, which means they lack the medical preconditions that make Fox News such a soft entry point into the brains of untreated mental deficients. Why would you watch Fox News if you can afford to see a doctor? That's why nobody in Canada or Great Britain watches Fox News. They don't want to die. And it's not just the decimation of our health care that makes Fox News so appealing to some, some senior citizens in America. There's also the eradication of our social safety net. Most senior citizens in America are struggling to make rent, fill their prescriptions and eat. So most, a vast preponderance of senior citizens are smart enough, are self-aware enough to rely on others. Then there are the handful of seniors who, instead of turning to others, turn to Fox News and they're taught it's a dog eat dog world. Or if you're a senior citizen watching Fox News, a man eats dog world. We're only talking about a couple of million here in America, only a couple of million senior citizens who watch Fox News. But that's all it takes to create a movement. Uh, all it takes is a, 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 a is a couple of million old, lonely, angry citizens, senior citizens. Just takes a couple of million old, lonely, angry senior citizens with simultaneously too much and not enough time on their hands to get just stupid enough to get just angry enough to get just frightened enough to get tricked into thinking Things like humans are not responsible for climate change if it's real. 
local police aren't racist, but the FBI is. They hate Christians and white people. And, you know, guns mean fewer gun death. And vaccines are more dangerous than COVID. It's a movement of senior citizens who believe this. And there's just enough for them to keep the Republican Party humming along. Look, America isn't a democracy. It's not majority rule. This is a country ruled by the people who want power more than other people want power. That's America. That's the way it's always been. In America, power goes to the people who want it the most and to the people who know exactly what they want to do with their power. Now, America used to be ruled by the 1%. Now it's ruled by the top 1% of the 1%. And why is that? Because the top 1% of the 1% wants it more than everyone else. They want it more. They want it more than you want free health care, free tuition at public universities, a livable wage, and an end to permanent war. They want their power and money more than you then you want these things. They want money and they want power and they want it more than everyone else. And they know exactly how to get it. They invent propaganda machines like Fox News or AM talk radio, along with all those think tanks. And of course, they keep a Republican Party going that couldn't care less what the American people think, because the Republicans can gerrymander, voter suppress and steal their way into elective office. And when these people and I'm using the term people generously, when they have their power, they know how to keep it by using it. They destroy unions, drill our oceans for oil. They open up public lands for mining. They sell weapons to autocrats, subsidize fossil fuel companies, give tax breaks to themselves and strangle the 99 percent social safety net to create a desperate workforce that will take whatever crumbs the five richest families are throwing at them. They know what they're doing because they know what they want. They know exactly what they want. More power, more money. And they will win every time. And things will continue to get worse in America unless we, the people, play the same exact Game Because in America, money and power trumps everything else. You want kindness? Tough. The people with all the money and power stole that from you. You want a quiet life with just enough? The people with money and power have commodified quiet. They have commodified just enough. Now you have to spend a fortune on the simple things that make life worth living. It now costs a lot of money not to care about money. You want a roof over your head? Remember when just having a roof over your head was a given? Remember that? Washington, like America, is money and power. And Bernie Sanders gets that. Katie Porter gets that. Elizabeth Warren gets that. And here in America, money and power is now a zero sum game. It's a zero sum game. In other words, when the richest one percent of the richest one percent take power, they take all of it. They take all the money from us and we need to play the same game and take it all back. Yes, there is plenty of money and power to go around for everyone Yes, if we all shared the wealth and power, everyone in this country would be taken care of. We're fighting a deadly, psychotic, sociopathic enemy, the richest of the rich, and they want it all. They want all of it. They've turned it into a zero sum game. So we have to fight a zero sum game, too, because they're going to win. They want it all. They're coming for our libraries, our parks, our playgrounds, our public schools, our air, our water. They want to take everything away that we own and then sell it back to us. 
You have to fight these people. You can't coexist with billionaires peacefully. I'm trying to fight them peacefully, politically, because you cannot coexist with billionaires. Either we eradicate the billionaires or they eradicate us. It's that simple. It is a fight for our survival. You can call it whatever you want. Socialism, democracy, social democracy, democratic socialism. I call it patriotism, love of country, which means love your neighbor, making sure that everyone has a say in how our taxes get spent. Participatory budgeting. America is is insane. It is insane and it is getting worse. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. We keep thinking, when does the fever break? It doesn't. The fever is the point. When I watch Fox News, I used to think, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Now it's like, yeah, I get it. This is the whole point of it. Uh, You know, after a mass shooting, Ted Cruz says we need more guns. That used to be insane. After January 6th, the official, after January 6th, the official Republican statement after January 6th was, quote unquote, January 6th was legitimate political discourse. That is the official policy of the Republican Party, that January 6th was legitimate political discourse. This is psychosis. And when you're dealing with this level of depravity, this insanity, there's no bottom. It's it's bottomless. Republicans will not get better. They will just get worse and worse and worse. And it will continue to get worse because they are a cancer. Billionaires are a cancer and they spread their cancer through, through places like Fox News. And I'm not putting it all on Fox News. They're the think tanks like Heritage, Cato, American Enterprise, the Federalist Society that provide a phony intellectual undergirding to all this fascism. In fact, Fox News is the least of it. It's it's useful because at least Fox has something resembling transparency. It's out in the open. You can watch it and see what the mind meld is. But, you know, with or without Fox News, with or without Rupert Murdoch, the richest one percent of the richest one percent are going to continue to foist their insanity upon us until we take it from them. Money and power. We have to take their money and power. My advice, don't argue with these people because would you argue with a rabid dog? What do you do with a rabid dog? You protect yourself from it and then send it to a farm. Send it to a farm. Uh, That's how we have to treat Republicans, people who watch Fox News, Rupert Murdoch. Take it from him. He's not even an American citizen, Rupert Murdoch. He bought his American citizenship. He, the guy who's screaming about immigrants creates an entire network trashing immigrants is an immigrant. Uh, don't fight. Don't fight. Do what Dominion is doing. Sue. Take their money and their power. Meanwhile, Rupert Murdoch uh, could testify next week in this trial. He's in his 90s. And has recently suffered a broken back, seizures, two bouts of pneumonia, long COVID, atrial fibrillation, and a torn Achilles tendon. And that's sad uh, because considering the damage he's done to America, one would wish his ailments were far worse. Rupert's two-week engagement to Ann Leslie Smith, a dental hygienist, was broken off suddenly last week. Well, you know what they say, Rupert, unlucky in love, lucky in dropping dead soon. It was a rape factory. Fox News under Roger Ailes was a rape factory. OK, we're running short on time. OK, uh, let's wrap things up with uh, a speed round and go around the world and see what's happening. We have to move very quickly now. Please like this video. Please share it. Uh, Office hours is this Friday night. We start at eight. Robert Smigel, 
We're going to interview Donald Trump at office hours Friday night, uh, starting at 8 p.m. Go to my website for the link. Please join us. Please comment on this video. I read all your comments. And the only reason you're watching this right now is because somebody copied and pasted an episode and shared it with you either through email or social media. So if you're enjoying this show and you want to help out, the best way is by sharing these episodes. All right, let's uh, wrap this up, find out what's going around the world. With their coronation only weeks away, King Charles III and future Queen Camilla spent 12 hours on Tuesday practicing how to sit. Go full screen here. As footmen prepare the royal carriage's trip to Westminster Abbey, King Charles is clearly hoping to save money on the coronation by using (laughs) artificial horseshit. I don't know if you can see the artificial horse shit. I think the artificial horse shit is just as good as the real. If, it, if you can save a little money, go for it. Meanwhile, it came down from the palace on Tuesday that Prince Harry will be there for his father's big day. Wife Meghan will not attend. Nothing personal, she was told. But like all previous coronations, this one, too, will be whites only. On his way to Easter services, King Charles spots the recently evicted Prince Andrew in Windsor Park, fashioning a bachelor's castle out of an abandoned refrigerator box and some duct tape. Prince William and Prince George walk to Easter services lost in thought, trying to best case the actuarial tables on how much longer their respective fathers have to live. As the entire royal family attends Easter services, Prince Andrew wonders whose castle he should break into for a warm bath. This is the stack of morning after abortion pills Heidi Cruz takes before jumping out of bed just in case she accidentally had sex with her husband Ted the night before. That's a lot of morning after pills. The former president leaves Trump Tower on Thursday for yet another deposition. And just as doctors feared, prosecutors have sworn the poor man in so many times his right arm is now frozen in that position. As Donald Trump returns from Thursday's deposition to his apartment at Trump Tower, the bedbugs and rats run towards him, screaming, Daddy, Daddy, did you bring us a treat? As the judge warns Donald Trump to refrain from inciting violence, his attorney, Joe Tacopina, calms his client down by pretend playing the keyboard solo from the opening credits to Succession. Speaking of which, on Monday, Don Jr. got written out of the will after telling his father this week's episode of Succession was the greatest hour in television history. Though only an American citizen since 2018, Melania's father, seen in the middle, began to fit in well with the rest of the Trump clan after he let slip that he's wanted in Slovenia on 15 counts of bank fraud. Melania's father, Victor Navs, had stopped by Mar-a-Lago, partly to hear Donald's speech, but mostly to pick up a few classified documents to turn over to his Russian handlers. By the way, that is, uh, that's Florida Congressman Matt Gates standing behind Melania's father. And whenever Matt Gates meets Melania's father, he always asks the same exact question. Ballpark the age of consent for me in Slovenia. Always wants to know what the age of consent is in Slovenia. Because he's a horrible driver, Arnold Schwarzenegger always travels with a broom to sweep up after one of his many, many, many car accidents, as well as a shovel to bury the pedestrian he just hit before the ambulance and police show up.
He actually hit a friend of mine. He's a piece of shit, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He crashed into a friend of mine, almost killed her. He's a piece of shit, always was. Jim Jordan grows lonely and depressed after another week goes by without Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene texting him a picture of her dick. Ah, she's cruel. No more dick pics from Marjorie Taylor Greene. A dutiful hand puppet, Jim Jordan, waits for Donald Trump to finish making a fist so the congressman can sit on it and then spew more lies in his defense. Racked by self-loathing and doubt, Majority Leader Steve Scalise once again corners Kevin McCarthy, begging the speaker to stop calling him his number two. Steve Scalise doesn't like being called his number two. On the road away from wife Karen, former Vice President Mike Pence often pays an American flag dominatrix to come up to his hotel room and pee on him. Very sick man. Because he's black, Republican Senator Tim Scott's announcement that he might run for president was interrupted six times after wealthy donors wouldn't stop calling the police, who then kept telling Senator Scott to keep his hands where they can see them. It's not easy being an African-American in the Republican Party. Presidential candidate and anti-vaxxer Robert Kennedy Jr.'s speeches are often punctuated by a series of wet sneezes and tubercular coughs, followed by a plaintiff appeal for a warm blanket and some Advil. Ah, look at that. Look at poor Bobby Kennedy Jr. He's always sneezing. Look at that. He's always sneezing and coughing. He should try getting vaccinated. Despite the lit cigarette in his hand, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un still insists on ordering off the kids' menu at Applebee's. <laughs> During a visit to his ancestral homeland, Joe Biden held high-level talks with the president of Ireland, who, because his wife just walked out on him, uh, had to wear the only clean outfit left in his closet. Can't do his own wash. That was the only outfit the president of Ireland had in the closet. And uh, President Biden, his sister and son Hunter, were so excited to touch down in Ireland, they moonwalked to their limousine. Arriving in Dublin, Joe Biden can barely focus on his speech as his drinking hand kept interrupting with, we go to pub now? I'm thirsty. How about now? We go to pub now? I'm parched. What about now? We go to pub now? Joe Biden's drinking hand insisted on grabbing the wheel of the presidential limousine. <laughs> it's got a nasty. Joe Biden has a nasty drinking hand. Got triggered in Ireland. Uh, Joe Biden's drinking hand insisted on grabbing the wheel of the presidential limousine to find the nearest Irish pub but then swerved out of the way to avoid hitting a leprechaun and ended up <laughs> sending 500 well-wishers to the hospital. That's a tough drinking hand, really tough drinking hand. More trouble after Joe Biden's drinking hand heard the woman say she was an O'Shaughnessy. And Joe Biden's drinking hand had no choice but to keep a promise he made to Joe's grandmother and punched the... <laughs> Let me start from the beginning. More trouble after Joe Biden's drinking hand heard the woman say she was an O'Shaughnessy. Joe Biden's drinking hand had no choice but to keep a promise he once made to Joe's grandmother and punch that O'Shaughnessy square in the face. Yeah, the Bidens and the, <laughs> the O'Shaughnessys. Joe's drinking hand kept a promise. <laughs> punch anyone named Joe Shaughnessy. <laughs> Later that evening, during his pub crawl, 
President Biden couldn't understand why the Irish hang their photographs and paintings on the floor. Hours later, a drunk and belligerent President Biden tore a karaoke bar to pieces, insisting he wouldn't leave until one of you pale faced losers finally sings Sinead O'Connor's Nothing Compares to You in the Right Key. He can get belligerent on karaoke night on the pub crawl. That's President Joe Biden uh, telling a karaoke bar that someone needs to sing Sinead O'Connor's Nothing Compares to You in the, uh, the right key. That drinking hand really got triggered in Ireland. The next day, President Biden and British Prime, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak issued a joint communique outlining a bilateral framework where both nations agreed the breakfast service inside the Belfast Belfast Hilton is subpar. Belfast Hilton. Both nations agreed the breakfast service inside the Belfast Hilton is subpar. It'd be great if I could pronounce Belfast Unable to take it anymore, Joe Biden signals his Secret Service to come over immediately and trim the British prime minister's ear hairs. Is that what's going on there? Oh, yeah, that's the signal. Uh, Bring the ear hair trimmer. After breakfast with the British prime minister, First Lady Jill Biden strolled the streets of Belfast while the president went upstairs to his hotel room to sample some Irish Shiza videos. Uh, That's Joe Biden watching some Irish Shiza videos. Then the president went down to the hotel pub and proceeded to blow 200 pounds betting on Australian rugby. We've all been there. We've all been there. That afternoon, a completely shit-faced president of the United States strolled the streets of Belfast, calling complete strangers Mr. Blarney Stone and then trying to kiss them. Mm. Maybe visiting Ireland was not a good idea. The president stumbled up to his room, got his Joint Chiefs of Staff on the line, and phoned in several drone strikes on the couple next door having loud sex. After a still drunk and belligerent Joe Biden finally came to... He angrily accused his reflection in the mirror of cold cocking him. Fighting Joe Biden. As President Biden exchanges small talk with the British prime minister, special envoy to Northern Ireland for economic affairs, Joseph Kennedy, the third surprises Joe Biden by grabbing hold of some presidential prostate. Yeah, that's a Kennedy. That's definitely Yeah, that's a Kennedy grabbing hold of some presidential prostate. Looking out over the Irish Sea, Joe Biden thinks to himself, so many drops of water, yet so few places to pee. Unlike America's free-spirited First Lady Jill Biden, the Irish Prime Minister and Joe Biden are looky-loos when it comes to enjoying Ireland's famed topless beaches. Yeah, that's uh, Joe and his friend enjoying Jill (laughs) at a topless beach. I'm David Feldman. This has been the mop up for April 14th, 2023. We're going to do office hours Friday night at 8 p.m. Robert Smigel will from, you know, Robert Smigel. He's going to do Donald Trump. So we're going to talk to Donald Trump. We'll have the professors and Marianne. I would love it if you join us. I'd like to meet the listeners. We start office hours at 8 p.m. Eastern. We go for about 90 minutes. You can find the link to office hours in the description to this episode or over at my website. If you sign up for my newsletter, which comes out every Friday night, there's also a a, uh, link for office hours. As I always say, the only reason you're listening to this right now is because somebody copied and pasted 
a link to this episode or an episode and shared it with you via social media or through email. So if you enjoyed any part of this and you want to thank me, share it with a couple of friends. Also, please like it. Please like the video. Uh, please subscribe to my channel. That's very important. And subscribe to my newsletter. Leave a comment. My regular listeners know I read all the comments, uh, wherever you post them, you can tell that I read it. There'll be a heart next to it. I think that covers everything. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you. <laughs> Monday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> I'm reading. Let me see. Oh, it's going. Uh, the Hershenfelds are here. We're Dr. laughing already. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst. His son, Ethan, is the author of Today Is Now. Go buy that on Amazon. Welcome. You brought up The Godfather. I'm reading The Sicilian, Mario Puzo's book that is a prequel to The Godfather. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I think The Sicilian is a little thicker than It's the other a little one. thicker. <laughs> And it burns the roof of your mouth, but it's a lot more delicious. It, it, it's delicious. He just grinds that stuff out. Let me ask I you. Happen, I happen to know somebody speaking of today is now. Actually, I know two people. And I did not want to disabuse them. I, I felt guilty. They are using today as is now as a genuine self-help book, and they think it is fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was my hope, that some people would mistake it for the real thing. Yes. Yeah. You know, that amazes me, because I recorded something for my podcast. It was a pretend letter from Clarence Thomas clearing the air. Uh -huh. And I said, now, Clarence and Ginny are Dear, dear friends of mine, they wanted to come on the show, but I figured they're, they're a little hot under the collar. Better I should read the statement from Clarence. And I got about four angry emails telling me I will never listen to your show again. I cannot believe that you are friendly with Clarence yeah. and Ginny Thomas. And my first instinct is to just scream at them. How could you be this? And then I think, well, I don't know what to think. What, what is my reaction supposed to be to that? No, that's good. I mean, you're, it means uh, you did a convincing job. Right. There's some people, there's a, I think it's, it's about uh, 12 to 17% of the population that don't have what is medically considered a sense of humor. <laughs> they have they have an inability to really get irony or sarcasm or jokes. I, I mean, I mean it. It's like some people. Uh, it's called concrete thinking. What is concrete thinking? Exactly that. You say <laughs> I'm best friends with the Thomases and, and they get pissed off. It doesn't occur to them that there's anything like tongue in cheek. They just don't get it. But they, they're probably very good at following a recipe. Yes, right. or being an accountant or, or a host of other things. Yeah. Is it worse now than it was 30? No, no, this it's is, always been this way? It's yeah. always been 12 to 17%. And I just want to, uh, as a disclaimer, all of the statistics that I mentioned on this mm -hmm. show are fabricated. Right, even that the number that all has been fabricated. Oh, was fabricated. <laughs> even, that was, even that was made up. Is that he, what... Go ahead, I'm he sorry. He learned that talent from his progenitor. His progenitor. Yeah. By yeah. the way, speaking of progenitors and progenitalia, <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk in the media about porn stars, but the people who really get ignored are the porn extras. <laughs> And I just wanted to announce 
to your, <laughs> to your audience that I not only have I started to get some work because I've you know I've been doing a lot of auditions lately I haven't been booking I've been getting close but I've decided I am willing to do background or as they call it now background work that's extra work I'm willing to do extra work now but only in pornography and so I've been booking that but not only that I've decided I've started an agency so it's, it's a porn extra agency um and uh it's called it, the, our, our tagline is we go the extra in. <laughs> so if you're interested in a career in porn, but a little bit shy and also have performance problems and are not exhibitionistic, but you're interested in sort of getting a toe into it, literally, if you want uh -huh. to put a toe into it on camera, um, just get in touch with me through my website. Uh, and this is an agency. It's an agency. And also I'm I'm upfront about how my agency functions. I'm out there working working the industry on a very low level because it's for the extras. I'm working the industry, but I'm upfront about the fact that I'm willing to steal any gig from my clients. <laughs> so I am in competition. A lot of agents pretend they're not in competition uh -huh. with their clients. I'm upfront about that. So uh, also there there is a retainer. You're not under under SAG, AFTRA, and uh, uh, Directors Guild. Regulations, you're not allowed to charge a retainer, but I, I'm i not a signatory to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I will charge you a retainer, but I guarantee um, you will be on set. <laughs> Everybody's a porn star in porn. It's like they're yeah. the millennials. Everybody gets a trophy. There are no character actors in porn. No. There's no porn walk-ons. <laughs> Everybody's a star. A porn cameo. Yeah. There's no porn cameos. Yeah. Yeah. If everybody's a star, then nobody's a star. That's that's always been my problem with pornography. Yeah. That's that's our other tagline for our agency. Which is if everyone yeah, if everyone's a star, no one's a star. <laughs> porn pornextra.gov. Um, that's our URL. Now what how about these people need a rights agency organization? They're, you mean so they retain the rights to their material? No, so they. I oh, mean, human rights. Yeah, human rights. They're an abused group, right? Well, well if, if if it's good enough, if the porn is <laughs> intoxicating enough, there. No, I'm ki kidding. Um, but what about protecting uh, ideas in porn? Yeah, like somebody, like. My grandfather was the first man ever to spit in porn. And I remember my grandmother saying, you should you should register that with the Writers Guild, yeah. Melvin, because and that was back in the in, it was a silent film. So really <laughs> this thing. That was before the talkies. It was this. It went silent and the spitties <laughs> and the talk that was doing the spitties. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Should uh, what's happening in Holland? They're closing down the red light district. I was always told that the the Dutch were very sophisticated when it came to the Netherlands. That they the red light district was a shining example of acceptance about humanity and needs and the yep. human body. And then all of a sudden. It's become a source of human trafficking. Yeah. They're ashamed of the red light district. They're closing yeah, it down. There's exploitation. There's exploitation, um, especially if you sign with my agency. There is exploitation. Um, um, and it's not. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, look, no one's hands are clean when you when you when you start uh, participating in that industry. Uh, yeah, there's just no way to do it. That's that's really ethical. And yet there are people who talk about ethical porn. They I'm being and they they talk about sex workers and rights for sex workers. And I've had s some sex workers uh, on the show. And, you know, I, I agree with whatever they're saying. Uh, right. But is I see it, what you're saying. Like, if, yeah, for the individual, if, the, if I guess it is in a country where it's legal, um, if that's the way you choose to make your living, I suppose there's a way to do it. But it seems like it very easily segues into the criminal, the unsafe, um, and the, the exploit, target, exploitative. Targeted. 
Right. Sick. Can you say, I'm going to ask uh, the fake psychiatrist, okay. not the real one, and then the real one can chime in. But uh, it, before you ask me, please hold that question. I just yeah. wanted to say, the, the other important thing is with sex work is not enough sex workers begin with a sex internship. <laughs> Because an internship is a great place to see if it's really the industry for you. Right. So there are not enough sponsorships for sex internships. And then you can really very quickly. Like I have a friend who had a summer job at a law firm. He knew this was after his first year at a very prestigious law school. And he knew within about three days that he didn't want to work in a law firm. Yeah. Very, saved himself a lot of hassle if there was a sex internship program. But don't, aren't you worried that only the children of the wealthy could afford to be interns? That's right. You got to. Yeah. Someone has to be supporting you. through that. That's yeah. A good point. So then you're going to end up with only pros, rich prostitutes. That's right. OK. Scratch that idea. What were you going to ask? You had something more. Important. Just rich. Pro do it yourself. Yeah. I don't know. What do you, um, so one of the questions I asked, at, at, at professionally speaking, can you make a? And I'm asking this of the fake psychiatrist. Is there any universe where a sex and again i'm not denying that porn is necessary that strippers are i'm not saying i'm not one of those i'm not saying it's immoral or wrong and that they should be shut down uh, you know uh, i i am concerned about exploitation uh but not really <laughs> no i am but uh if somebody comes to you as a fake psychiatrist and says, uh, I'm a sex worker. Fake or real sex worker? A real sex, well, mostly real, except for what was paid for. Uh, but most of her is, or him, is real. And can you treat a sex worker without addressing what they do for a living? Without that, without judging it, without... Fi helping find a pathway out of that or can mental health coexist with being a sex worker it's a uh, tough question well no i would unfortunately my answer is that, that again disclaimer i don't know anything um but that having been said um it's 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 case by case david i'm sorry it's a boring answer but it's really right. case by case basis i think that there are probably just like in every industry there are healthy people who do it and there are unhealthy people who do it and there are people right. who have pathological reasons for doing it people who have real objectively defensible reasons for doing it a, a lot of people i think end up in there because they don't have another path to making an actual living we live in this country where you can work three jobs and barely get by right um, right so no i think that there, there there's a whole a whole range um but if you happen, there's one, I think the sweet spot is if you happen to have a sexual perversion and you enjoy it and it happens to line up with a customer base and there's a market mm -hmm. for it and you happen to not mind mixing capitalism and concupiscence. <laughs> where you, so you can just go to work, get your rocks off and fill your bank account at the mm -hmm. same time. And it's win, win, win. Yeah. Every everyone goes home happy so right. it's safe sex in the sense that it's safe but you're also feeling you're safe do you want to comment on your colleagues uh, di diagnosis doctor real doctor um, yeah I, 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 I think I would accept most of what he's saying yeah. however <clears throat> I don't have a lot of experience with this kind of person. I, I did have some early in my training when I would work in hospitals and some of these people ended up psychologically very damaged and ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Right. Uh, and But my guess is that again, for most people, it's psychologically damaging to participate in this kind of thing. Uh, how about Stormy Daniels? How does she seem? I mean, she seems right. like 
okay person, but you know, we only see the surface. Right. Right. It, it's, uh, it's a lot of surface. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I could hear there's a voice in my head saying I'm being judgmental. I'm not being judgmental. There are I've had I've heard people say this is legitimate work. Most men, a lot of men, it's not about the sex. It's about the companionship. It's about going out to dinner. Pay me for my time. The, that the sex is not really the most important. I mean, I would pay. So it's not about the sex. It's about the companionship. So so it's like a very long marriage. Yeah. I mean, I would pay somebody to argue with me and then apologize. That to me would be what what a week to, on a Friday night. David, you're a complete moron. <laughs> no, I'm not. OK, you want me to move on. <laughs> Hang on, I got to go change my pants. Do, does anybody win an argument do, 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 when couples fight? I mean, I guess if you're trying to end the argument, then you admit you're you're wrong. Do, I think a lot of couples, if there is an argument, the, both members, both halves of the couple are winners by definition, because neither one is required to stay there and argue. There's a door in every relationship. Okay. This is a key thing that people forget. There's a door and often there's a car. <laughs> so you can go through the door and then into a car. So, <laughs> There's a choice. There are two doors, choice. actually. There's two doors. The car has a door. There's many. There's so many doors. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and there are even windows. <laughs> there's so many ways to get out of an argument that the fact that arguments happen means that both, at least one, but probably both parties are getting something out of the argument. What are they getting out of it? What they're getting out of it is an attachment as spicy and maybe unpleasant as the attachment is, many people are only able to experience the attachment in a vital and sort of heated way through some verbal aggression. So I find that with a lot of my imaginary clients. <laughs> Do your imaginary they, clients pay on time? They, they pay me very handsomely, <laughs> imaginary money, but um, it's a way to interact. And so, and a lot of times you'll find if you're in a long relationship or if you've witnessed a long relationship or if you've watched any sitcom ever, there are arguments that continue and continue for episode after episode, decade after decade. It's not about the content of the argument. It's about the fact that you have that person there to argue with. So I, I would say um, in, in the it's, it, it, it's, it's good to take a new, a new perspective. If you're suffering in a relationship because of all the arguing, if you feel that that's a problem, I, I invite you to look at it from a different angle and say, actually, this is, this is, uh, this is what I'm getting out of this whole thing. Dr. It's, Hershenfeld? It's, it is fulfilling in certain ways for some people. Where it can become a real problem is if one of the parties is Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> <laughs> then you're lost because he's yeah. one of those guys who just, well, go ahead. But. Well, this probably would fit with him. If one of the parties comes from a family where people were screaming at each other morning, noon, and night, and then 20 minutes later, everybody's happy. Right. But the other person in the relationship has never seen anything like this, takes it really seriously. They have a big blowout. And the next morning, one of the parties, hey, how you doing? I hope you had a good right. night. And this other person is in a slow burn, <laughs> rage, funk, not talking. This is a big problem. Well, what if that person is your child and you say, look, that you come from a family where people scream at one another? 
Yeah. <laughs> so get over it. This we scre- we're screamers. No. Uh, but isn't no. it wrong to to scream and yell? It, aren't the cultures that reward? Uh, I guess all cultures. Well, but let's not talk about that. But uh, in the end, if you were to sit down and work it out, the the person who comes from the family that doesn't scream and yell, that's passive aggressive, that takes it out on you when you don't know they're taking it out on you, isn't that much <laughs> healthier than honesty, transparency, no, and not, screaming? It's worse. it's worse. The screamers, not that I'm advocating screaming because uh, I'm not into screaming, but the screamers have a chance of working it out. The passive-aggressive sulking types, they they don't solve anything. Half the time, the other person doesn't even know what's going on in their mind. So passive aggressive people are liars, basically. They, they, yeah. There's something duplicitous about I'm yeah. a nice guy. I'm not making any trouble. By the way, you have a flat tire. I don't it's know. It's how- important to make a distinction between the screamers, the shouters, the yellow, the yellers, and those who holler. They're, they're all very different. <laughs> and they just, hollering is not acceptable under any circumstances. Screaming sometimes, it's a slightly holler, higher pitch. Yelling can be loud, but it's less aggressive. And shouting is just all out warfare. <laughs> Keep those in mind when you're raising your voice. Isn't there something, can't you trace the uh, latitude of America based on yelling, shouting, screaming, but like the, the lower you go, in America, the more likely you are to hear hollering. Is that? That's right. Hollering is it's strictly Alabama Mississippi, <laughs> and certain, certain <laughs> regions of Louisiana I, by you. I hate to have to bring this up, Ethan, but one of your favorite relatives was a hollerer. And he even used that word. Yeah. Your father, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do hollered. remember that. Yeah, I, I, I now that I'm saying it, I do remember it. He would say hollering. But, but the hollering, it, there's almost something uh, about preserving a way of life. When people say, when people are hollering, there's something genteel to it. It's from a, from a, a, a different time. It, it's nothing think, personal. It's a of, custom. You're thinking, you're thinking of carrying on. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that has a, a patina of culture. Uh-huh. Yeah, hollering, I don't know. The, the shouting, the further you get to the Mason-Dixon line, you, you hear shouting a lot, right? The, you know, this is how Hillary got in trouble, David. Talking about the deplorables? Yes, that's, you're, you're edging towards that. Right? But I, I'm not sure who the deplorables are. I, I, think they may be, I think they may be up north. Isn't that a... Um Oh, no, it's The Degenerates. I'm really, I enjoy that, that Netflix comedy series. There's a bunch of people like uh, Jim Norton and uh, others doing 20-minute comedy sets in Vegas, and they're just right. really kind of raw. It's could you, could you ever sit somebody down and explain to them why they're deplorable? Is it, is it possible with, with a clipboard and just all these boxes that have to be checked and you just explain to somebody... You really are a deplorable human being. And here, here's, here's why. And this I is don't what think deplorable you can do that with. But with, with problems or with character, or character styles that have been diagnosed or if there, where, there, where there's a taxonomy about it, then you can actually find those lists. If you're five of these things, then you're a sociopath. Right. If you're five of these things, then you qualify for narcissistic personality disorder. Um, if you're five of these, you qualify for a low interest loan. There, you can you can find all of these uh, lists online. But I don't think depl- I think deplorable is more of a, a judgment call. Right. OK, so this morning uh, I have a a new ricer where you take cabbage or cauliflower or even rice and you rice it. And actually, if you rice rice, you get cauliflower. It's unbelievable. So. Um, making lunch, 
with cauliflower rice. And I look at it. And I'm over. It's like uh, Proust's. Not, it's not like the Madeline. I'm not. But I all of a sudden I'm thinking. Th- this is making me so happy. With all that's going on in the world, this cauliflower rice that I'm baking and I'm looking through the window, it's it's making me really happy. And the first thing I thought was, I'm dying. I must be dying. That's where I... Huh? What's the connection? That if this is what's making me happy... Okay, but what about it was making you happy? That you were creating a new healthy food stuff? Or that it was very economical? Or that you loved the taste? I mean, the must you should have just stopped at economical, doctor. <laughs> Once you said economical, that was what else was there to say? <laughs> I don't know. It looked beautiful. It was so pure and white, uh-huh. and oh, so it was a a a reprisal of your virginity. Yes, is what it represented. I was fine. I was growing back my virginity. Yeah, your I, purity. I, uh, I, I have, was thinking at the, the whiteness and the, the flocculent. Flocculent? Flocculent. What does flocculent mean? It means woolly, like mm. tough wool. So the, the flocculence of that uh, riced cauliflower, I believe it might have brought to mind clouds for you. Mm-hmm. And clouds brought to mind heaven and heaven brought to mind the afterlife. Oh, as OK. We're suddenly in the realm of death. Well, I, I do. They did look cloud like. And yeah. I, and OK. We should just do an episode without Ethan and just talk about how brilliant he is. I, I think we should just we could do it with him. I, he doesn't like it. I, 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 I wish I could agree. Uh you know when people say, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't like that. Like when they start a sentence, because it's very confusing. Like someone says something and you say, I couldn't agree. If you like, if you lost the rest of that page, or if you have to turn the page, or if you get cut off, it sounds like you've said, I couldn't agree. What are you reading? Uh, I'm reading my neighbor's mail. <clears throat> don't do that. Don't, uh, don't. Not when I'm drinking seltzer. Please. How is it? It's illegal. It's a federal offense. I, I know that, but how is how's the mail? It's better than mine. That's why uh-huh. I read it, and I'm not going to stop. Do you, uh, do, now, do you lend? Can, you, can I borrow it if I promise to return it? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can option it. it. And also, don't lose my bookmark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't lose my place. What are you, what, what are you reading? I'm Listen, still reading I'm, Great Expectations. It's sad. I mean, it's sad how slowly I'm reading it, but that's mm-hmm. what I'm reading. And Dr. Hershenfeld? I'm actually listening to Great Expectations, which I absolutely love. Huh. And, by the way, I'm going to further embarrass Ethan. I Just by happenstance, I met somebody who was in his college class, and when oh, we figured out who was who and who knew who and whatever, this person said he was the, what was the word? Asshole. <laughs> Ass. Oh, douchebag. Douchebag. Douchiest asshole. It was some. It was something extreme. The most prominent or most loved or most something in our entire class. No, no, no. Prominent. Um, she said it, I was the tallest in the dorm. I think. That's what <laughs> and you played junior varsity. Junior varsity cello. <laughs> What was your happiest day at college? Did you have a happy day at college? Like where was where you just felt this is amazing and it's going to last forever? Do you have a day where because I never had that yeah. anywhere, any place, any. No, I unfortunately I was I was wound very tight. I had a lot of exam anxiety and, and essay at the end of the semester anxiety, and I was. I was in that state a lot. So for me, unfortunately, a lot of those moments of 
are, are moments of feeling relieved that I'd finished a big project. And were you like, a good student? I was, but I, I don't know how you'd qualify good. I got good grades, but I was, I wouldn't say I was a good student because my kind of intellectual curiosity slash enjoyment of what I was doing factor was not high enough. I was more on the anxiety, get this done. It was, it was not healthy. I mean, I had some of those decent moments, but no, unfortunately I can think of, uh, well, I'll get back to you on that one. And I can answer that question. What my happiest day of his college career And that's all that matters. Yes, it was. He was waiting for his acceptances or rejections from college. We get a fat letter from Harvard. And I jump in the car and drive down to his school in Manhattan. I find his classroom. I knock on the window. <laughs> the teacher gives me a dirty look. And I'm waving this letter. And he comes out and I give him the fat letter. That was yeah, I remember that was, that was exciting. I thought I was in trouble because what was, what was, why was my father? Well, you were. In chemistry <laughs> class, yeah. Uh, that has to be. I, I wouldn't know what it's like to get a, uh, a fat letter. But what I am thinking of doing is writing letters to Harvard, yeah. getting responses, steaming yeah. open the envelope, saving them. And then mailing thick envelopes to the children uh, of uh, people I dislike. Okay. With, with, with a big, uh, just a pile, a stack of rejection slips. That, it's very uh, creative. David. Thank you. What are you reading, doctor? Oh, you're reading Great Expectations. Um, along, with, along with a bunch of other things. I, I, I can't folk. I think it has to be with old age. No. I cannot focus on just one thing at a time. Have you, you do? I have noticed in trying to keep up with the news that every time I pick up the paper, it's like it used to be a soap opera. Yeah. But now it's a brand new, fresh hell that you have to uh, catch up with. It's, it's a brand new indictment. It's a brand new war. It's a brand new conflict that comes out of nowhere. And there, except for Trump, there's continuity with Trump. Yeah, there is. I'm grateful for him. But, but, but one question I have is, are things really worse? Or is our news collection and broadcasting reached such a exquisitely fevered pitch that we're just bombarded day and night I, I, stuff. It gets back to no parent in America brags that their child is in love. Nobody, nobody says, I'm so happy my son is in, he's in high school and he met a very nice girl and he's so happy. It's always, you know, the drive, the, the competition. Nobody, they, nobody tells us what the good news is. There is good news, isn't there? Yes. Yeah, I think there is. Yeah. Let's plug some gigs. This was fun. Ethan? Oh, boy. That's my, that's my, that's my gig. Plugging voice. You, no, I did record a thing, this narrative podcast last week, which is coming out soon, and it's called Best Laundrette. You can find it on IMDb, and it'll be out in like uh, two weeks. So I'll I'll mention it again. It's called Best Laundrette, and it's a uh, it's a um, interestingly, the writer says it's not in the plug the 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 log line or whatever. He says it's it's not a love story. It's a loss story. So it's kind of about two people coming together over a shared loss as opposed to oh. an actual. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice, really nicely written story. Best Laundrette. So I'll plug that again when it's coming out. Fantastic. Oh. Yes. Are you allowed, Dad, are you allowed to mention what you you have coming up or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was interviewed by Malcolm Gladwell to be on his... Uh, revisionist history. Wow. 
that's going to be coming out at the end of the summer or early fall. Wow. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. That's a real podcast. I've reached the big time. That's like, that's, yeah. You got to clear that with Mendelssohn, my executive vice president of uh, fear and oppression. (laughs) Can't do it. We'll get the release. Send the release form. All right, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Great. A lot of fun. Thank you. God bless. Bye. Bye. Be well. Thank you. Be well. You be be well. well. You be well. You be well. That was, uh, oh, that's UB Blake. The Reverend is here. Joining us is the Reverend Barry W. Lynn. He is the author of the new book, Paid to Piss People Off. Go buy it right now. And he is a reverend and is a, a lawyer. And we're going to have to do another Friday night. To we we only did porn, which is book two, but there's prayer and protest and peace and peace. You're close. Did you see those commercials on television uh, all the time about with an African American guy who explains life insurance, and he says the only things that matter are P P and P, hmm. and then he goes, "That's price, price." And price. If I see that ad one more time, <laughs> I'm thinking of another P word that I would like to apply to that company, whose name I literally I've seen it 500 times. I don't remember what the company is that he's hawking his PPPs for. Well, now one of the great joys is every now and then you come on pissed off. There's no, nothing pleases me more. Than an angry <laughs> reverend. <laughs> there should be more of us. Yes, there should be. I say, you know, during one of the shootings, I forget, there's so many mass shootings. They had this minister on and <laughs> on uh, CNN. And the, he said, well, what do you think about this? And he said, well, you know, we have to think of some new thing. No, you don't have to think of new things. You have to take a moral stance against gun manufacturers and the idiocy of people who believe that if they have 12 handguns in their house, somehow they're going to protect the plantation right. from the terrible people coming in right. from the Mexican border. Right. You don't you hear- have to You have to stand for something. What is wrong? Why aren't we hearing people who do what you do for a living on television saying that? You never hear that. No, you don't. And uh, I, I may have mentioned before there was a <clears throat> there was a woman who ran the uh, Sex Information and Education Council of the United States, SECUS. As soon as she decided to actually go to seminary, she used to be on the Today Show all the time. She was never invited on because she was a Unitarian minister. And in fact, the only when I used to do Bill O'Reilly's show, um, he wanted me to be the reverend. And when our communications guy at the time said, you know, Barry'd really like to talk about the legal angles here. And O'Reilly's guy said, no, no, no. They just want him to talk about the religious aspect, which was fine because, of course, Bill O'Reilly, <laughs> Bill O'Reilly, I mean, he was he was. I want to be polite here. I mean, he was one of the dumbest people I ever encountered in talk radio or talk television. I mean, he was a guy when we were talking about evolution, which we talked about uh, many, many times. He once used the argument. He said, you know, there has to be a God. Because if there wasn't, uh, we would we'd never have the systematic development of species like we do have it. I said, are you saying that evolution would be evil if it didn't have it? If it didn't have a good outcome. I said, you, are you aware that there are whole species lines <laughs> that die out? They don't go anywhere. That's not evil. Randomness. Then he tries to say that's evil. Randomness is not evil. It's neutral. 
it's not evil. But he would he would just persist about that. And then, of course, he usually said, well, I want to give you the last word. And then, of course, uh, he didn't, although it was pretty damn good by uh, the end of his career of being able to say, by the way, and add to my final right. two cents. Right. So now you're angry about <clears throat> not somebody in your personal life. You're angry no. at a corporation. I'm angry at a corporation. I'm angry since you brought up the book Paid to Piss People Off. Uh, and I've mentioned before that uh, Twitter wouldn't allow me to advertise it because it has the P word. And I'm mm. not talking about price. Mm -hmm. One of the seven dirty words that in 1972 got uh, George Carlin literally arrested. Well, is it a seven dirty saying, word? Are you sure? It's one of the seven. Yeah. Okay. I verified that okay. because I couldn't believe it myself. But it's wow. there. And... Um, but in terms of the publicizing of this book and the promotion of it, I'm at a wonderful time doing the virtual, you know, a book books signing here a couple of weeks ago. And I, I've done a couple of other shows and I've got a couple more coming up. And I even did a podcast with a sexologist in Scotland mm. uh, about a week ago, which is up now. But you, you reach... The, if you look for people to promote a book, you would think that if you went to a big publishing house, which I did in the first book I wrote called Piety and Politics, uh, that you would actually get help. I mean, this is a big company. They gave me an enormously large advance for this book. Then they assigned to me a guy from Australia, in case people didn't know he was from Australia from his accent, he used to wear a tie every day, every time I saw him with kangaroos on it. <laughs> I don't think he ever opened the book. I mm -hmm. don't think he knew which side of the separation of church and state mm -hmm. argument I was even on. Right. And at one point he said, maybe we should market this back in the, uh, you know, the books about flying saucers. <laughs> I thought, what are you talking about? It came out the same, you know, Random House has a lot of imprints. Uh, it came out the same Tuesday as 101 other volumes, 100 of them by living people, and one from Soren Kierkegaard, who was, you know, long dead at the time. But you can't do it. Book, book publishers make an enormous amount on um, selling the biggest books. At, and I'll get into the cost issue in a second, but they they want to make sure that their biggest authors have big spaces, cardboard cutouts in the bookstores to the extent that they're still around that show a, a smiling Stephen King mm -hmm. with his latest book. Right. But as far as the rest of it, it's all loss leaders to them. They never made a penny on the advance they gave me. That's how big it was and how few copies it sold. <coughs> They never got me on any TV shows. I had a wonderful communications department at Americans United. They got me on all kinds of things. And I find that that's the way I'm doing it now by myself. But I thought maybe I could find somebody who's a professional book promoter. Right. So I found a place yesterday that uses the word Amazon, although I don't think it has any actual relationship to Amazon. The guy we arranged to talk yeah, two days ago, and he was going to explain what he was going to do, and he sent me an email that had a bunch of misspellings, mm -hmm. and I thought, okay, maybe he's, he seemed to be literally in a cafeteria somewhere. There were mm -hmm. dishes clanking all over mm -hmm. the place, and I said, what, what is it? You sent this contract, and it says, we guarantee that you will make up to... 200% of your investment. I said, you know, you may not be a lawyer, but I am. When it says up to, right. that could mean the Down 10 to. cents. Right. And I said, and why is there this clause about um, uh, not saying bad things about the relationship? A, a kind of, a, it's not a do not compete clause. It's a, it's a kind of clause that, they, that Trump used to get all of his uh, women 
friends to sign in. A non compete clause. Non -com <laughs> no, yeah, it, was, it could have been a no. non compete clause. But no, and, and I said, you know, that's ridiculous. I never sign. I never sign something like that. I'm going to say anything I want about you. And if you want to say anything you want about me, that's fine. So then he says, I said, look, I've been, we've been talking for 10 minutes. I can tell this is never going to work out. No, no, no. Please, please tell me. Uh, uh, let me talk to you for another 30 minutes. I said, I don't want to waste another 30 minutes. I said, just just go find somebody else to talk to. I am not interested because I don't think you really are going to do anything for me. For the next two hours, I got every half hour another message from this guy offering to have me talk to his supervisor about. Finally, I said, you know, two things. I said, I told you not to call me again. I told you not to email me. That was four emails ago. I said, I don't want to hear from you. Maybe you're a wonderful person, but you can't do this. You continue to put mistakes in the emails. I, right. I correct one, and then the next one has a misspelling and a grammatical error. I said, this is not the way you encourage someone to become so excited by your business that they're going to sign on to it. It's not. Then he writes another note. Mm -hmm. so this is. <laughs> but here's the thing. <laughs> so today, I by the way, to a lot of people who are listening to this are thinking, "I wish I could be like that guy." <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's it, it, by the way, he wanted he wanted to charge. You know, this book is a trilogy. Um, he wanted to charge three thousand dollars per book to do this promotion mm -hmm. never ever did he describe a single thing he was going to do so this morning i was talking to another guy who seemed to be somewhat more legitimate i mean maybe he is legitimate um and i said look before you give your elevator pitch i said i just got a couple of questions and i started he said tell me the first three things you're going to do what are you going to do for me and he gave reasonably good answers but this idea, publishing, it's hard enough. I mean, I worried that I'd have to self-publish for a while because that's filled with con artists. I don't think there's a single self-publishing company, including Amazon, that in any way uh, is legitimate. They're all scammers. And I think the book promotion people are pretty much in that same But category. there are people who self-publish and do make money, right? They do. I mean, our friend Frank Conniff did that. He, right. he self-published. He made on, on his, and there, I think there is a particular ability to do that with graphic novels because I think it's, it's just a different kind of world. But the other thing I learned so far in the publishing business I did not want to sell this book on Amazon because of the many times that you've had on this show, people who try to form unions there mm -hmm. and workers who are terribly treated. Right. Amazon warehouses are nowhere like what you see in nomad land. Right. And you can't do that. You literally can't do that because if you have a small publisher, the small publisher has to go to a kind of other company that then sells books. And that company cannot say no to Amazon. They can't. And they Amazon gets roughly any book for 36% of its list price. So when people go to Amazon and they see bestseller list price, $35 discounted to $22. Amazon is still making a fortune. Right. And this is why back in the 1960s, when the book Small is Beautiful came out, I think I was thinking about it today. Schumacher, I think, was the guy who wrote it. Not the John. Well, uh, yeah, he was he small. Was short. Yeah. He wasn't small. Um, but <laughs> but um, there's something about bigness that corrupts absolutely it's not just big pharma it's not just big gun manufacturers or arms dealers it's anything 
gets so big that it becomes irresponsible. It no longer cares about anything but its bottom line, and its bottom line generally is not for the people who work for it, but for the people who run it. And one of the things that made me not mad is that uh, if you've been following what's going on in Los Angeles County, a union representing healthcare workers is trying to get on the ballot a resolution to be voted on in the next Los Angeles election that would limit the outrageous pays to presidents and CEOs of hospitals, including wow. so-called nonprofit hospitals. Good luck with and that. It's, it's capped. It's capped at whatever the um, total compensation is for the president of the United States. And in all their promotional material, it says that when you add up all the goodies that the president gets, it's $450,000. Well, the Hospital Association in California has sued them to keep it off the ballot. And what they claim is that it is misleading, and there is a California statute that says you have to be honest when you're proposing an, an initiative about what it contains, and uh, that they don't count, for example, that the president gets a palatial mansion mm -hmm. <laughs> that and, he gets and, security all the and time if he knows harlan crow <laughs> if he knows harlan crow <laughs> we'll get to him in a minute but the, the this idea when i was doing a talk show three days a week with pat buchanan there was a very controversial, speaking of California, very controversial voucher initiative in California. And it was defeated. And we managed to work with a lot of groups to make sure that it was defeated virtually everywhere it came up. Buchanan, ironically, used to be against school vouchers, something I once pointed out to him on, on Crossfire one night. But he said, so he comes in, he sits down, he goes, well, congratulations, because you did win the California primary. He said, but you know something, Barry? What we're going to do to you people, meaning anybody that's to the left of him, right. we're going to initiatize you to death because you spent a fortune fighting that. And we're going to have five ballot initiatives in every state, and you'll never be able to find the money to fight all of them. And although... That hasn't quite happened, but I thought this is a brilliant idea for the left. We on the left ought to be encouraging initiatives that do the very things that the union in California wants to do. Take an industry that you know is, is uh, ruining the lives of hundreds and thousands of people and cap their, cap their income. Maybe... Uh, I've always been in favor of uh, something called the uh, <clears throat> maximum income. It's not; it's the opposite of the minimum income. That there should be some number where, if you're earning it, you can't earn more than it, or the tax would be a hundred percent. But these ideas, if if we, for example, and this is, I've talked to people about this one. Talk about science. A resolution, an initiative that says only sound science that is peer reviewed may be discussed in public schools. We know from all of the data that if you ask people questions about economic and social issues, they're kind of on the side of progressives. You ask them about uh, the minimum wage. You ask them about what health care is covered. Uh, you ask them about what Medicare should cover. They know that they want to cover hearing aids. They know that it should cover eyeglasses. On the economic front, they know that you cannot live on a $14, a $15, or a $16 minimum wage. And they, they support it. Do you think we should raise the minimum wage? Overwhelming percentages of people. They don't buy into all the crackpot economic theories of Arthur Laffer and Reagan and on and on to, uh, to today's conservatives. They don't buy it. 
But then you ask, well, why is it if the public is in favor of raising the minimum wage, cleaning up the health care system in a dramatic way, why isn't it being done? And you come back, sadly, to money again. Mm -hmm. You can't. It is very difficult to raise money on the left for progressive causes because there are so many things that we on the left ought to be supporting and you can't pay for all of them unless people think this is i'm just angry about right wingers i get every day at least two emails from organizations that claim that they're going they're going to solve some problem and the worst one in the last couple of days it came across with a headline Justice Clarence Thomas is crying, big bold letters. We need to hold his, him to the fire. He just should not be serving. Then when it comes down to what are you going to do, which they rarely do, fundraisers, I'm happy to say that I used in my uh, 25 years in running nonprofits, you, you can't. You can't just say, we're going to do this. We're going to get rid of Clarence Thomas. They don't even say, some of them say, we need to expand the Supreme Court. Yes, we do. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to do it? And why, since most of them end up saying at the bottom, we need more Democrats in the Senate. No, we don't. We need the right kind of Democrats in the Senate. We do not need Manchin in the Senate or Cinema in the Senate. We need people who really have the democratic principles that were articulated by Franklin Roosevelt and right. on and on. And those, but those emails suck up so much money. God bless them. There's still people raising money now to run against Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, she has a very safe district. Yeah, all what white. are you going to do to defeat her? If the money that was spent in the last campaign against her had been spent in those more marginal districts in California and New York State, the Democrats would still be in control of the House. Don't throw your money away. And don't ask me to give you money knowing that you got no plan and you're going to essentially throw it away. I'm drinking some tea now. I'm right. Out of control. So the, uh, Clarence Thomas makes $268,000 a day from Harlan Crow. No, the, the Supreme Court, <laughs> uh, they pay $268,000 a year. Yep. You should be able to live on $268,000 a year. If you can't, then don't yeah. sit on the court. Go work for a corporate exactly. law firm. But Thanks. you have security, yeah, of tenure, you can't lose your job, and it's a life of the mind. What If that's not good enough for you, now it turns out that Harlan Crow bought a home for property? A from, series of homes. What, what happened? Yeah, he bought them back in 2000. Well, he bought them back in 2014, and one of them was the home that Clarence Thomas talks so much about in his autobiography. His mother lived there, and Harlan Crow's argument was, we should preserve this because someday you know, people will wonder, where did this great thinker, I think he referred to Clarence Thomas, the greatest thinker of modern history, hmm. where did he grow up? That should be, we should preserve it and we should fix it up. And they, they did, they spent tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand dollars to fix it There was it no up plumbing there. Yeah, they had bad plumbing. No plumbing. <laughs> they know plumbing. Right. They put plumbing in. That's expensive. I'm putting plumbing in. That's right. expensive. But the point is that this idea, Clarence Thomas, of course, last week, his argument was, I, 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 I didn't know anything about the ethic. I asked some other lawyers and they must have given me bad advice. So we're mm -hmm. supposed to believe last week that he didn't know that it seemed unethical to take hundreds of thousands of dollars from this donor and then uh, expect nothing in return. He, he acted like he only met him uh, after he was on the court. That turns out not to be true. He knew him before then. And now this thing, 
This is a man, Clarence Thomas, who does not deserve to be on the court, not because of his ideologies, but because of the fact that he has the nerve to think. He understands women's reproductive health better than women do, that he understands the dangers of living unprotected in Chicago, in New York City and Los Angeles. Therefore, let's bring more guns to those cities. This is a man who's not just wrong on the way he interprets the Constitution, but he's, he's in this incredible ability to claim that he knows better than the rest of us about all the great questions, political and moral questions of the day. So this thing of today is this, you know, butter, uh, butter on the bun. I think it sounds dirty. Keep going. But, you know, (laughs) this is just, this is the last straw. I mean, there is no, but what are people doing? They're holding hearings about it. That's not enough. I want to see Democrats say, it's time. We don't need any more hearings. We've had all the evidence. We made a mistake. You know who? The guy who got Clarence Thomas on the court was Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden knew that there were people, not just Anita Hill, but two other women who told virtually the same story, virtually the same story. And he didn't call them to testify. Ted Kennedy sitting there on the uh, platform, uh, on the the hearing, and there were no women Ted Kennedy was more silent. Ted Kennedy was more silent during those hearings than Clarence Thomas during a (laughs) Supreme Court hearing. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, but, you know, Pat Leahy, all these people and and I, you know, I I know many of them and I but that was their worst moment. I mean, Clarence Thomas eked by by think memory may be false two or three votes. I mean, they just, there needed to be questions asked that were more difficult than the ones that were. And we do learn from Clarence Thomas, who actually, in response to one question, said he supported the separation of church and state. That's a flat lie. He knows exactly what that meant at that time in legal jurisprudence to say he, I believe in that. To say that he never he never talked about abortion, we're supposed to expect that this guy living with his mother in a house with no plumbing and then goes to a school and then goes to Harvard Law School. He never had a conversation about this. That's re- impossible. It is impossible. Do you remember anybody saying, you know, uh, he was a judge already. Uh, judge Thomas said, uh, I find it hard to believe that you never had a conversation. I mean, think back, you never, in a dormitory, you never talked about it. You didn't notice that something called Roe versus Wade had been decided. Nobody asked those questions. It is horrendous what Democrats get away with not saying and not okay. saying. And when it comes to the future, I'm. I'll stop whenever. No, no, no. I, mean, I have a question, but go ahead. Things are not looking good in the 2024 election. Right. Ann Coulter, uh, who I've never, uh, you know, if you read Paid to Piss People Off, there's a couple of interesting anecdotes about my uh, adventures with, uh, with Ann Coulter. But with right wingers in general, I mean, it was possible to find some kind of a connection. Ollie North against the death penalty. Uh, Jay Sekulow in favor of Medicare for all. Even Henry Hyde, the anti-abortion lunatic, uh, was correct in, uh, in saying speech codes on college campuses are not a good thing. You right. can deal with hate speech in other ways. But with, with Ann Coulter, there was never a moment of agreement. But then just a few days ago, she wrote a column in which she was writing to her fellow conservatives about the dangers of holding on to Donald Trump. She said, I haven't seen too many. I've seen some people on the left make this argument, and I make it all the time. I want 
I don't care what happens to Donald Trump in any of these hear hearings. I don't care what the prosecution does or doesn't do. I want him in the race and I want him to be the Republican nominee because all of the people, including Tim Scott, who just yesterday, an African-American uh, Republican from South Carolina, Tim Scott, when asked, do you have any differences uh, on, on policy with Donald Trump? And he said, no. And they said, well, what do you think about abortion? They asked him that today. And he said, well, you know, I think we, we have to <laughs> right. think. No right. answer. That's the kind of thing. Tim Scott, Ronnie DeSantis, right. Nikki Haley, Pompeo, and the people who haven't gotten in formally, like the Sununu, the governor of North of New Hampshire, they all have the same policies, the same misunderstandings about economics, about justice, about the Constitution as Donald Trump. The one thing Donald Trump has that Democrats might be able to hone in on enough is that he is certifiably loony, that mm -hmm. he says so many goofy things that those people in the middle, the Democrats who voted for Trump once or twice in the past may say, you know, we're enough already with this. Nikki Haley will lie through her teeth. Sununu will lie through his teeth once he gets in. He's essentially been blessed by CNN. He's on all the time as a moderate right. and a moderate. Democrats ought to hope ought to hope they're running against Donald Trump next year because every additional person that gets into the Republican primaries is just another person who will not hurt Donald Trump's 20 to 25 percent vote. They will only hurt each other and he will once again prevail as he probably knows. And as Ann Holt Coulter was warning people about, it's just another example. I just don't agree with her. I think we should applaud that because that to me is the only way I see a Democrat winning the presidency in 2020. Going up against Donald Trump. Going up against Donald Trump again. Yeah. They, uh, they, they only do have Donald Trump. Nobody else even comes close to winning the popular vote or the Electoral College. The Republicans are completely bankrupt when you it's you know, you can gerrymander the Congress. Mm -hmm. You can buy a Senate seat in, you know, places, you know, rural states. But a presidential election, it's really hard for a Republican to win the popular vote. They don't win the popular they, vote. They don't. Because what they stand for is not popular. What could <laughs> the Democrats do right now? They can't pack the court. They don't have a well. No. The Senate. Well, they do have a, a majority in the Senate. Do you need Congress to pack the court? No, you you don't. Um, How do you pack the court? Well, you do. Well, the, the two things. One. You need to expand the court, and the, that that does require uh, that would require actions by the House as well. And so, the idea is the House is you know it's totally beholden you know to the. the uh, are you absolutely? I'm I'm just curious. Are, are we certain that you need the House to pack the court? I I think to add add justices to the court would require. Because it's not in the Constitution. Houses. It's not in the Judiciary Act. It, has it ever been no. codified how many Supreme Court justices there are? No, or is it, it a norm? No, it never has. And we, we used to have, after the Civil War, we only had eight for a while. And um, But it's never been, well, it was considered during the Roosevelt. That right. was real court packing. Well, we're talking now an expansion of, of people who just know what the hell the Constitution meant, what it means, how you interpret it. You can't seriously look at the Constitution and say, these people who wrote it were right about everything. Thank God we'll never have to touch this again. Right. So there is this very complicated method of changing the Constitution by having a constitutional convention in enough states to, uh, and then, uh, you know, to ratify changes. But it, um, no, I, I don't think you can. 
That's kind of like your question about AOC last week, where she talked about impeaching Clarence Thomas, which you, you, you can't you can't do. It has to start in the House. Right. It you, there's nothing she can. I mean, she can do something with articles of impeachment, but it ain't going anywhere because it needs that needs to to uh, to start in the House. Yeah, my par- I gave my parliamentarian the week off. So all did the- you? Yeah. I wish you you had a, it hired her. It, 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 she, who, who's in what, what are these pictures in the back that I'm seeing here? I realize some people are not watching this or just listening to it. What it, is that? Is that? It wouldn't be my book back then. No, it's not paid to piss people off. It hasn't arrived yet. But Blue it hasn't Cedar, arrived yet. Blue Cedar Press. Yeah. Blue Cedar Press. Go to Blue Cedar Press right now. Paid to piss people off. Buy it right now or get it at Barnes & Noble. It is a trilogy. And it's the storied career of the Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Three books. We talked about porn. We have to rebook. Uh, did you did, did you do did, did you enjoy doing Friday nights? Was oh, I did. It? Yeah, I me liked too. That very I liked much. it a lot. Yeah. Follow the Reverend at Barry W. Lynn. Go to barrywlynn.com for a treasure trove of this man's appearances on some of your favorite television shows. And go to bluecedarpress.com and buy paid to piss people off. Thank you, Reverend. Stay out of trouble. Thank you. Only good trouble for me. Thank you. 